Good afternoon and welcome to today's ACPE Academy webinar. My name is Mark Medwood and I'm the program manager at the ACPE. Today is the third and final webinar in our series focused on spiritual care of the non-religious. Today's topic, Spiritual Care of Jews Who Identify as Non-Religious, is presented by the Reverend Mary Martha Teal, the Director of Clinical Pastoral Education, and Rabbi Sara Pasha Orlo, Rabbi and Director of Spiritual, spiritual Care at Hebrew Senior Life in Boston, Massachusetts. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback from the ACP Academy webpage for members of ACPE. Additionally, the slide presentation will also be available for future reference. At the conclusion of the presentation today, there will be an opportunity for you to submit questions. When you move your mouse on the screen, you will see a Q&A button. Click on the button and type your question. Due to the potentially high number of questions that will be asked, not all questions can be answered as part of the webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters, Reverend Mary Martha Thiel and Rabbi Sara Pasha Orlo. It's so nice to be back with you, and it's nice to have my colleague, Rabbi Sara Pasha Orlo, with me today. I would not um, dare do something on spiritual care of American um, Jews without doing a lot of collaboration with Jews in the process. Um, collaboration is really part of what allows us to do spiritual care across tradition. So that's a very important part of what um, we hope to be modeling in this webinar today. So this is the third and final of the series. It says Beth Nadich under my name because of the computer I'm borrowing, but I am Sara. And my slides are not moving. My slides are not moving. Okay, we need some help getting the slides moving. Mark? Mark? Yes, if you click on your screen to go back, you're probably in Zoom mode, just click on the screen. And then you should be back in your PowerPoint. Oh, all right, there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this is a symbol of the Star of David. And it was new to me to understand that this symbol is actually a secular symbol of, of, Jew of the Jewish people. It was chosen as a symbol in 1354 in Prague. And for most Jews, it evokes not the religion, but the Holocaust, the state of Israel, the identity and survival of the Jewish people. So today, we're going to do three basic things. We're going to talk about the demographics of American Jews, including the ways of being Jewish in America. We're going to talk about strands of non-religious Jewish history, and then implications for spiritual care of American Jews. So we begin with demographics, and it's important to know that Jews are a very small part of the American population, something like 2.7%. Um, and, and Jews have a disproportionate um, representation in some parts of um, some professions, the ac academia, medicine, and so on. This particular um, Pew Forum Religious Landscape Survey says 1.7%. Um, different surveys range from 1.7 to about 4% in terms of who counts as a Jew, and that's why you may see different numbers at different times. And one of the reasons that we're, um, that we're talking about this today is that um, the spiritual care of Jews is has some different components to it because Jews are historically different than some of the other religious traditions um, that we serve in our various institutions. So I'm assuming that many of you who are watching today are Christians of some denominational affiliation. And it's typical in Christianity, it's not true for everyone, but typical, that the biggest part of being Christian has to do with beliefs, religious beliefs, and one's behavior, 
or ritual might be next important and the sense of belonging is the smallest part of being Christian. It's just the reverse when dealing with Jews. So that the sense of belonging is by far the most important and biggest part of being Jewish. Um, behavior, ritual behavior, following its vote, and so on, those um, are less important. And belief is really um, a small part of being Jewish in America today. So that if you ask many Jews what they believe, they may be puzzled by the question. It's not a question they're talking about in their own community. They may be talking about ideas about beliefs, but not about what they personally believe themselves. So this is almost the inverse of what Christian chaplains are used to. And that has implications, of course, for what appropriate spiritual care looks like. Can I interject for just a second, which is just that for those Jews who are observant, then behavior gets much bigger. So when you say it's a small part, you mean it's a small part of the population for whom that's essential. Yes. Not that it's a small part for those people. For all, for all Jews, that's, that's certainly correct. I want to draw our attention to the difference in calendars that we use. So this slide shows a typical, what we might call secular calendar, which um, is a solar calendar, and tends to be the calendar that most things in America run by. And we know what the secular holidays are and so on, and um, this is the way we tend to think about time. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, and it has its own holidays, its own following of the seasons of the year, and it's very much more connected to um, the seasons of growing, agriculture, and so on. So for Jews in America who are um, observant to any degree, there's an awareness of this two sets of calendars that are superimposed upon one another. It's important for us as chaplains to know what is going on in Judaism as well as other traditions um, on a given day. It's really important for a chaplaincy office, for example, to have an interfaith calendar so that you know on a given day if you're seeing someone who is having a holy day um, that is very important to them, that you will not miss that because you as a Christian chaplain are only working with so-called secular calendar. This piece is important. I want to go back now to the Pew study that we've looked at um, quite a bit. And in 2013, um, Pew drilled down into its earlier study of American religion and noted that American Jews categorize themselves into two groups. So by self-description, there were Jews by religion, which on these slides is often referred to as J-E-Rs, Jews by religion, and the second group being Jews of no religion, J-N-Rs. And just as in the general population, secularism or being unaffiliated is growing in America. That's true in the Jewish community as well. So although these two pieces of data come from different sources and they were not identical in the way they measured, um, the 2000-2001 study showed that 93% of Jews in America said they were Jewish by religion. By 2013, 78% said that they were Jewish by religion. That's a huge demographic shift in 13 years. Some of this may have to do with the infusion of some of the Jews from the former Soviet Union, um, but the pattern is matching what's happening in the rest of the American culture. 
Jews as a, as a group are less religious, so-called, than Americans as a whole. And Americans as a whole who say that they have no religion are 14%. It's double that for American Jews who say they have no religion. So when approaching a Jewish patient, we need to know that there is twice as much chance that that person may not identify with the word religious um, as someone um, from another tradition, especially a Christian tradition. Jews by religion tend to believe in God less frequently than members of other religious groups. So I think that's fascinating that there are Jews by religion who um, significant um, percentage who believe in God, um, they do not believe in God. Jews of no religion, in contrast, are more skeptical of God's existence than religiously affiliated uh, people in the American public as a whole. So in general, again, we're seeing this less um, religiosity in both groups. Let less belief in God in both groups. Yes, sorry. <laughs> they, they identify as religious. Um, Jews by religion mm -hmm. identification decreases by generation. This doesn't surprise us. This is true in other traditions as well. So here you see, according to generation, how um, the identification as be, of being religious among Jews decreases. So the greatest generation, who are the people who we serve in our institution, um, it's 90% plus. By the time we get to the millennials, um, we're down at 68% with a consistent move down. And some particular groups of Jews, subgroups of Jews, are even less likely to identify as religion. So here in this particular cartoon, um, the one person is saying to the other, I may be a member, but I wouldn't identify myself as religious. So you, what you see is stairs up which someone will walk to be sacrificed. And not surprisingly, people who have been hurt by religious tradition become less likely to identify as religious. So it's no surprise that LGBT Jews are less apt to be religious. And this is because religious tradition has so often caused spiritual trauma, not just distress in these individuals, um, although it certainly depends on age, uh, denomination or movement of Judaism, personal experience, supported membership, and so on. And that is getting much better um, with younger people and a significant change um, within the movements of Judaism today. Jews from the former Soviet Union are also less apt to be religious. And this makes all the sense in the world. They it was illegal to participate in any kind of religious um, behavior, and it was just illegal. So atheism was taught in public schools, and so we have lots of residents who studied atheism. And so today, some may have no interest whatsoever in meeting with a chaplain. Some may, may be very interested in meeting with a chaplain, um, in terms of learning about their heritage um, more than being enculturated into the tradition's value of study. Um, some are very interested um, in, in more secular um, forms of uh, spirituality, and we'll get to that later in the presentation. Holocaust survivors. survivors. Um, no one is surprised that many Holocaust survivors um, may have lost belief. Uh, and 
it's also interesting to know that some survivors retained orthodox belief and practice coming out of the Holocaust and held on to that um, very tightly. And for me, that that's the part that was more surprising in my learning. This particular um, little story comes from a new book about three generations of the Holocaust called God, Faith, and Identity from the Ashes. And um, so you've got a bunch of soldiers who are exhausted, running, carrying wounded soldiers um, back to safety. And a secular soldier says to a religious soldier, tell me, where do you get the strength to keep running? The religious soldier says, from God in heaven, how about you? And the secular soldier says, from Auschwitz. So here you see a, a distinct difference in motivation. Both are very Jewish, but very different in um, what the, where the spirituality is located. So what does it mean to be an American Jew, according to American Jews? So the most important piece is that American Jews have a high sense of belonging. The student now? Yeah, what I, you want me to go in here? Yeah, okay. So when we look at this slide, we see um, that 94% report being proud to be, proud to be Jewish, a real, um, celebration of what it can be to be different in America. It's happening today. 62% being Jewish is a function of ancestry and culture, its heritage. Only 15% say it's a matter of religion, which is really interesting given that we had, you know, higher numbers signing up as Jewish um, by religion than that percentage. So even though they're, they're considering themselves religious Jews, but not seeing that as something that's necessarily a matter of religion. And this, and, this yeah. may be connected to a theme that we've seen earlier in this series about people being very allergic to the word religion. So if the word used in this study had been observance or spirituality, or spirituality, there might have been a significant difference in what showed up. So we have 19% tying their Jewish identity to observing halakha, which is which is Jewish law, and that's that's a combination of the the close to the percentage of Jews that are Orthodox, which in any given geographic area is going to be really different, but is no more than 12%, um, plus those Jews in conservative and other parts of the Jewish world who observe um, Jewish tradition. So 28% participate in the Jewish group. That's a surprisingly low number. Um, and fully two-thirds of those surveyed believe it is not necessary to believe in God to be Jewish. So. It's a confusing slide, but I think it tells us what questions we should be wrestling with. And again, it's really important for Christian chaplains to understand that two-thirds of Jews believe that it's not necessary to believe in God to be Jewish. So continuing here, um, we have Jews over 65 um, saying that they care greatly about Israel. That's an essential part of Jewish identity. We see this really clearly in elder care and in the majority of people in the hospital. Um, and, that high, and that older Jews are, are very connected with, with the history of the Holocaust. And many, many of them have spent large parts of their lives working for social justice. So continuing on, there's no... If we thought that by religion and not religious were ways to differentiate, it's it's much more of a combined group. So we have 20% of Jews by religion who do not believe in God, and 45% of Jews who are not religious saying they do believe in God and being ritually observant. What that means is you can walk into an observant shul and and close to half the people there might not have God at the center of that practice. Um, the self-ascribed definitions as religious, cultural, and secular blend into one another. And so we have about 40% of all American Jews calling themselves somewhat religious, somewhat cultural. It's, it's, these terms don't 
create good definitions. And what we're learning is you really have to greet the person in front of you and understand what they are bringing without assumptions of religiosity or belief um, and behavior. So in, it, just to complicate that picture further, this, this cartoon is of an of a interfaith couple here with the man saying, should we have a mezuzah? And the woman saying, should we have a Ganesh altar? altar? Just showing how um, any given family you're working with could very well include people of all backgrounds. And the majority of Jews who married since 2005, only 10 years, um, have married non-Jews. So the, the makeup of families has become incredibly complex religiously, and that's important for chaplains to know. What works with one member of the family may not at all work with another member of the family. So this is just a, a, a cartoon bringing this out more. The two great parts of our ancient family are now the Jews of North America and the people of Israel. And when we get together, we argue, feud, finger point, and quarrel because, after all, it's a family. Um, there's some nice pieces in here. It's the Jews of North America and the people of Israel, meaning that Israeli identity is a whole other um, uh, concept to think about and understand. But that, and also accentuating how Jewish life is often about bringing all the differences together, and that that's a there's a comfort in all that difference. Almost, it's it's a place where we where we are diverse and and create people that together. There's much greater comfort with disagreement and difference of viewpoint in Jewish culture than there tends to be in Christian culture, and that's important for chaplains to know. One other just cartoon to bring out these themes, a sea of Haredim of ultra-Orthodox Jews are dancing, singing, and praying in Jerusalem, but the secular demonstration was bigger. How can that be? The secular Jews demonstrated their traditional way of taking part. They watched it on TV. Um, showing just how it's one people. Everyone's engaged, just doing it their different ways, and that, um, and that the line between secular and, relig and the ultra-religious even can become blurred. And it and it may the difference may be huge, just as it is in Christianity. So we see just the wealth and breadth of different things coming out in Jewish life, and you should just explore the the various things. But what this shows is just you have yoga, you have Jewish meditation, you have all the different New Age um, and neo Hasidic the ways in which um, traditional thoughts and beliefs are being translated into new ways of practice and, and, and community. Just as in Christianity, there's this eclecticism of putting multiple uh, traditions together. So we're transitioning to part two of this, um, looking a little bit at the history of Judaism and and how we understand um, where secularism comes from as we look back through history. So already in the Bible, there's an, um, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, we see that there's a book included that never mentions the name of God in it. It's very much a story of our people, and yet it's there in the Bible, and religious tradition has looked at ways to pull God, see God in it, but, the re but it's also a book that doesn't mention God's name. It is about a historical moment in our peoplehood. Um, looking at rabbinic texts, I put this page up because there's all these different views that are included in study. And study becomes a practice of not simply the, the, the core biblical text, but the texts that have been brought to speak to it over generations. And all of those become a conversation throughout history that we enter into today that is, is, a, is a human narrative. This is so different than what typical Christian Bible study looks like, um, which does not include on the page um, thousands of years of commentary and conversation and all the differences of opinion. So thinking about um, Jews having been traveled out in, around the world and all the different cultures that Judaism, that Jewish people have lived in helps to also understand the um, diversity that is among Jewish people, but also we took in the, the ideas and thoughts of different cultures, um, including secular thought throughout the Enlightenment and um, 
so just under there's no one story there's many many strands of the story and there's many cultural influences um, Jewish enlightenment brings us the idea that God no longer actively intervenes, intervenes in history. Um, the picture in the middle there is of Spinoza, who was excommunicated for his secular views in 1656 already. You have uh, the Guide for the Perplexed, which was a very mystical text, but really was trying to um, bring secular or, or philosophical views into conversation with the tradition. Um, and we have Jews spreading enlightenment values throughout Europe up to the night um, with and and groups like the Society for the Culture and Science of, of the Jews. We have secular Zionism. We have Jewish socialism. And in the 20th century, um, Mordechai Kaplan and the Reconstructionist movement, understanding God as the highest values and aspirations of the Jewish people. So there's just a strong... Secularism is mittendrin, is, is there interwoven with our history as a people. Uh, I, the 614th Commandment Society, um, again, this is an interesting one because there's traditionally understood to be 613 mitzvot, commandments, as, as recorded by Moses, by the Rambam, by Maimonides. And the 614th Commandment that um, is understood to be remember the Holocaust. Now, Secular Jews have no trouble calling that the 614th commandment, meaning standing on the history and the legs of an observant um, commandment-driven society and, and culture. So again, this builds on what Mary Martha said a little while ago, just about how we have space exploration replaced religion in the USSR is in this slide. For most of the 20th century, the thirst for space exploration replaced religion in the Soviet Union with the cult of science disseminated through propaganda, not sermons. It's, it's one, one angle on just understanding the pain of, that was felt by, by um, religion being completely wiped out and undermined during this period in Soviet history, in Russian history. And, and, Judaism, um, Jews facing a huge amount of anti-Semitism and, and, and then arriving in this country in terms of our pastoral care today and having to understand themselves once again in a new world and, and being greeted and, and taken in by the Jewish community and trying and finding their own path in this country. So continue emergence of secular views. These books are two examples of many as, as, Jewish Americans have continued to explore identity in this world beyond the religious op options. And, and these are two beautiful examples, really clearly recognizing that there are so many Jews who don't have God at the center of their Judaism. And also with the morning meditations, there's the religious, religious life has morning meditations, and yet this is a secular activity. And so just the um, understanding that for the non-religious Jew, there could be a lot of spiritual life still right there. Continuing that theme and understanding that, I mean, the symbol here, it's so fascinating, is the menorah, the ancient symbol of Israel, um, with the turned into, fused with the human body and sort of um, secular humanism is coming right through there. Part of what I love about this symbol is that the seventh flame in this menorah is the human mind, and this is the um, this is the symbol of humanistic Judaism, which um, even trains and ordains rabbis today and has congregations across America. And this is a, a slide from their website, which is just so fascinating because what you see from this is that humanist Judaism has held so many of the traditions, um, including a morning prayer service that is very recognizable to anyone who belongs to a synagogue. So in addition to humanistic Judaism, Workman's Circle has long been around an active ethical cultural, culture society, Society for Humanistic Judaism, which we've been talking about. Um, these are all, just, I mean, it's I, in Jewish American history, there has been so much secular expression. The federation system is a secular Jewish way in which we take care of each other. Many religious Jews interface with it, but that 
the primary organization of Jews in America has been through secular forums. Workman's Circle is the part of secular Judaism that has kept very much alive Yiddish culture and language and music and so on. So in many cities, you will find that there are Yiddish choruses that come out of the Workman's Circle um, organizations. So these, these two letters spell Chai, the commitment to, to life. And so this is just one symbol of many that spans religious and secular life in the Jewish community. So we picked out some of these values that remain shared between religious Jews and non-religious Jews, and certainly the value on life is, is one of those. And another one is study, so essential to Jewish life and to, again, across all of these um, different paths that we've been discussing is the, and, and, and the fact that there's an old man studying here evokes that this is a lifelong thing. It never, it never stops the commitment to learning. And learning as a, as a form of prayer is, is essential to, to a religious definition. And the study could be religious, a religious topic, or it could be secular, but study itself is a shared Jewish value. Israel, as we've spoken about, and that is so debated in hot topic on college campuses, among um, people who have been alive a little longer, there's just a deep core of connection and belonging and a sense of this homeland that um, is, again, an essential part of Jewish identity in America. So the average age of our folks is 90, and in our synagogue we have two flags. We have the American flag, there's a great deal of American patriotism, and we have the Israeli flag. And that's what this picture is of, because Israel is also a given um, high value. Music is, is another core feature of Jewish life and spans the secular and, and religious worlds. And here we see a klezmer band. Um, the whole klezmer music and is, I don't know, we try to go to those places that are beyond words that cannot be explained. For me, these are very sacred places when you're experiencing something that is so profound that there is no way you can begin to express it through words. We have patients, survivors, who, who bring with them melodies from the old country, who deepen their soul, patients with dementia who cannot articulate words but can chant or bring up melodies, and it's, it's deep in the soul. Uh, this is a Yiddish music festival showing that it's not just the elders, but there is a whole new wave of, of Yiddish music um, being lived. And Nikunim are wordless tunes, which are also an important part of Jewish music, that are meditative. Um, they're traditional ones and new ones, and um, chaplains use um, Nikunim quite a bit in working with, um, with Jews. Tzedakah and giving charity is also just an essential feature of Jewish life and a way of making meaning. And again, it spans very, it's, it's deep in the religious tradition and it is deep and, and real in the, in the secular Jewish culture as well. The predecessor organization of the one we work for um, was funded by people going around in the neighborhood with little sadaka boxes collecting pennies and nickels um, to build the first one. And I think that's um, just a really special part of um, the community ownership of our institution. Again, the, the memory, gifts in memory of loved ones and recording that, what you see here is again a less faith-based religion. Um, the understanding that, that the way a person live, lives on is through their deeds, through the charity they gave, the change they made in the world, and the way we remember them is is one of, is the strongest sense of what eternity is. And so the fact that there's so many named buildings and plaques, the next slide shows um, even more plaques and names being remembered, um, is because this is this was the promise to Abraham that his descendants would be numerous, um, not that he would live forever. And so this sense of generation to generation next slide, is um, is is shown in the the 
words that are printed over this memorial plaque are grandchildren are the crown of the aged and the pride of children is their parents. The sense of generation to generation of being a vertical religion that passes down through families is essential to understanding um, secular Jews. You'll see that a few of the names are lit up on either side and each day someone goes into our synagogue on the two walls with these memorial plaques and lights um, the names of people whose yard site, whose anniversary in the Jewish calendar is that particular week. And it's not unusual at all for family members to come and visit the names at the time of the yard site. It's really um, a very powerful um, practice. Okay, so part three. What does spiritual care then look like? Um, in this very complex context. So we've seen this slide before. Um, the spiritual care task really is the same when it's boiled down. Uh, we have to do spiritual assessment. This will identify areas of spiritual strength in a person and identify areas of spiritual distress. From that, we make a spiritual care plan that builds on their stre strengths to decrease the spiritual distress and increase their sense of well-being. We do it using the patient or resident's language of meaning. And then we have to evaluate our work and adjust the plan as necessary. That remains true. So it's complicated in practice <laughs> without asking someone, we don't know if a Jewish patient before us is religious or not, or some combination thereof. They may be part of the 40% of American Jews who are part of both of those categories. And it's very important for non-Jewish chaplains to know that Jews may well be cautious about non-Jewish chaplains who come to visit them. The Jewish community still carries trauma um, from the Holocaust, as well as separateness is a very present um, reality about the Jewish community. Well, it's not just Holocaust, it's anti-Semitism. Um, most of our residents here had some experience of anti-Semitism during their, their early lives. Mm -hmm. So again, here's this word code switch. We need to code switch with a spiritual assessment tools into the kind of language that the person in front of us is using. So for each theme that we're listening for, are we hearing religious or spiritual responses or non-religious or both? Uh, and we're going to use then mirror back language like the person that we're dealing with. We want to think about each person as a culture of one. Um, this look at American Jews, um, I hope, really convinces you that this is essential. And as I mentioned before, family members may not at all share the same perspectives as the primary uh, resident or patient. In terms of prayer, we've talked before about personalized blessings um, and open-eyed prayer, so expressing what might get expressed in prayer um, without a prayer form, and that may be perfectly appropriate for a non-religious Jew. At the same time, even non-religious Jews sometimes find hearing prayer very healing. So it's still appropriate to ask if a person would like um, a liturgical prayer, and if so, would they like it in Hebrew, in English, or in both? And if you're going to do spontaneous prayer, a really excellent um, resource or model is a book by Naomi Levy called Talking to God. This, I think, is just a beautiful um, quotation. Oliver Sacks, um, who was a wonderful researcher and medical storyteller, um, referred to himself as an old Jewish atheist. And one of the last things he wrote was in the New York Times. And 
He wrote, and now weak, short of breath, um, my once firm muscles melted away by cancer. I find my thoughts increasingly not on the supernatural or spiritual, but on what is meant by living a good and worthwhile life, achieving a sense of peace within oneself. I find my thoughts drifting to the Sabbath, the day of rest, the seventh day of the week, and perhaps the seventh day of one's life as well, when one can feel that one's work is done and one may, in good conscience, rest. Oliver Sacks is a really good example of someone who was neither religious nor secular and both religious and secular. When his time of dying came, he could only find enough depth in the metaphor of the tradition to express what he wanted to say. It's a beautiful example of how these things coexist in one person. So a chaplain needs, needs to use all the secular tools um, in their kit. Family photos, ethical wills, art, poetry, going outside, reading, sharing music, listening to the person's narrative, um, as well as asking whether there are any, any religious things that people might actually want included. Um, and we might want to ask about, does the person want a mezuzah on, on the uh, doorpost of their room. Do they want candles for the Sabbath? Um, they may, even if they self-identify as not religious. Ethics, as always, the guideline is no proselytism or manipulation. None. So we see that there are many, many kinds of American Jews, many, many paths. And we hope that we have um, shown you how complex this really is and how we need to approach each person individually um, as a culture of one that is there for our exploring and building relationship with. Um, this particular series of three webinars is based on three open access articles that were published in Plain Views. Um, so they're there for you to read if you want um, information with more depth. And they're also available on the ACPE research um, webpage, thanks to John Eman. So now we're open for questions from you. We're looking at the Q&A page and not seeing any yet. So if you type some in, we're happy to respond. Great, so the questions are starting to come in. The first is, what is the difference between race and religion? Um, so race is an interesting concept because there's, race doesn't really exist. I mean, we talk about it as a concept, but it doesn't really exist because there's no genetic congr congruity in any one group. Um, in Judaism, we talk about peoplehood, um, and, and our history and traditions as a people. Um, that's a concept that people can, um, can, you can convert into peoplehood. Um, through the religion. So I hope that's enough to that. Do you want to add something on that one? One of the fascinating things to me is that there are um, pockets of Jews in many parts of the world. And so um, in Ethiopia, there was a large group of Jews. In China, there's a group of Jews and so on. So it's never as simple as we think. The second question is here is, um, I'd like to hear more about the symbolism of the Star of David. It's an ancient symbol that came in, as we spoke about in the 16th century, more traditionally, more uh, organizationally being used as a symbol for the, for the Jewish community. 
Um, today, it's a very strong symbol of identity. Uh, so one study has said that it came into practice in some ways as a way to have a parallel to Christians wearing the cross, that there was a need to have some symbol that people could use, identify themselves with in a positive way. So there could be a reactive uh, element to how it's worn by people around their neck as a as a as a charm of sorts, um, but it's simply a strong symbol of Jewish peoplehood. No one knows why two triangles were chosen. Um, it was chosen for a flag in 1354, uh, but nobody knows why. So I find that very interesting. In terms of suggestions for books for Hebrew prayers for non-Hebrew speakers, um, Marsha Falk's Book of Jewish Blessings is a beautiful one, and her, her different collections of prayers. As well as the Naomi Levy book that I um, referenced in the slide, which is much more spontaneous prayer, um, but it's beautiful, and it models speaking with honesty and authenticity about very everyday um, challenges. Um, the next question has to do with a mini ethical point of view um, uh, about regarding weaning patients from ventilator. So in it, from a Jewish ethical position, um, if there is the, if the, the outlook is that a patient can live being weaned, then, um, there is an argument for that. What, what is generally done is that the ventilators are on a, on a cycle. And so at the end of a cycle, rather than re-upping the ventilator, restarting the process, um, the ethical point is really our commitment is to keep someone alive. If their quality of life, if they are no longer, um, if they are understood to be in a dying process and it is the ventilator keeping them alive, then there will be different views by different parts of the Jewish religious world. Um, there is no commitment to extending death. There is, um, if life is possible, there is a commitment to giving that a chance. So you will see across Jewish pluralism very different answers to this kind of question. So. In orthodoxy, there is going to be a push for very aggressive care all the way to death. And at times, that comes into conflict with the values of a more secular medical sphere. Um, by the time you get over to Reform Judaism and Reconstruction Judaism, um, there's basically a guideline, do what your conscience tells you. And so there's much more freedom about somebody deciding to um, turn off the the ventilator. So it's really important to know where I would, I would temper where, that. where somebody's located. Well, the, it, it, the conscience also has to be inconsistent with the person who we're talking about, the patient, mm -hmm. obviously. It needs mm -hmm. to be according to their advanced directives and their desires for, for how they would live their life and how they would conclude their life. Uh, the next question here has to do with um, other concerns or factors that might be relevant for Jewish patients when visited by Jewish or non-Jewish chaplains or their own clergy. Um, I think that there's many, many Jews who haven't come into contact with clergy for much of their lives. Uh, they may have last had a conversation with a rabbi uh, at the time of their bar mitzvah. So there is a factor of just the religious personality, the religious persona of a chaplain is something foreign um, and, and not something that they see as relating to their life. So I think it's, it's creating that bridge to a more secular concept and understanding chaplaincy as something that can speak to wherever that person finds meaning is going to be critical to making that connection. Typically, congregational clergy are going to be there to represent the community as well as the beliefs and mores of that particular denomination or community. Chaplains are, are trained to be much more um, interreligious, multi-religious, and they have the benefit of being, in a sense, anonymous, of not following that person back into the community. One of the things we have to find out um, 
whenever we as a chaplain visit someone is whether we are wanted and in what way we are wanted, how can we best serve that, that person. So the community clergy person and we as a chaplain may be feeling very different kinds of needs for a particular person. And it's part of our assessment job to find out what it is that we can best um, do for the patient. So the next question is, is Renewal Judaism an eclectic combination of SBNR Jews as well as religious Jews or something else? As I understand it, Renewal Judaism is interfaith. So Renewal Judaism um, overlays, with, is, is overlays with Reconstructionist Judaism and Reform and is is a movement to find new meaning and is very much looking at meditation and at chanting and at, at, at American popular forms of religious, of spiritual expression and how they can be um, expressed through a Jewish lens. Uh, it's only interfaith insofar as the doors, it's, it's so many families have people of different faiths and people who want to come through that door are not going to be questioned, but the understanding is they are coming to have a Jewish experience. So it's not interfaith insofar as there are multiple faiths reflected in the practice, but it is welcoming of, of people who want to come through that, that door. It's a particularly um, lively um, kind of Judaism in terms of drums and so on um, and there may be um, dancing so some neo Hasid kinds of feel to it um, and most people who consider themselves renewal will um, definitely use in, um, the language of spirituality for themselves so it's a um, it has a very different flavor than um, some other parts of the Jewish world so follow-up question here is what is the difference between Reconstructionist Judaism and Renewal Judaism? So Reconstructionist Judaism um, is a movement that has a rabbinical school in Philadelphia and was, was follows the thought of Mordechai, Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan. Um, Renewal Judaism is a movement within the Reconstructionist movement but that reaches beyond it and has uh, an, another rabbinical school called Aleph, that in some ways Renewal Judaism has influenced the whole Jewish world as um, more than having so many practitioners itself. But uh, the difference is these two threads. You can look up Aleph and Reconstructionist um, and you'll see more online. 94% of Jewish Jews are proud of their culture. Are they also proud of their religion? No, they're not, because <laughs> unfortunately, um, especially orthodoxy is something that can be very, very foreign to secular and, and not religious or cultural Jews. And so they are potentially proud of their path, of their history, of their people. But especially in, in the 21st century, with the discord and disputes going on around Israel, so often religious Judaism plays itself out in the in the international screen due to what's going on in Israel, and so um, there's a real break there. Uh, let's see. Next question: Where could I find resources for the music you mentioned earlier that other chaplains have found useful? Nigunim, N I G G U N I M. Um, if you look up Nigun, N-I-G-G-U-N, um, do a web search, you will find a lot online. There's various websites that have, including um, Hadar in New York, that have a lot of music on them. Uh, so start searching and it's all there. And the music that we use with Jewish residents um, really varies. So um, Nigunim are are certainly one kind, but then um, we showed a, sh a slide of klezmer music, um, which has a very different flavor. And that particular um, CD is brand new, but it's a recording from before World War One. So historically, it's a very um, exciting new new release of 
of klezmer music. Um, Jews in the former Soviet Union love some American music of performers who actually traveled to Russia um, during um, the time right after World War II. And so there's some very interesting um, loves of music that you wouldn't predict unless you ask, do you have favorite music? Um, what is your favorite music? Um, chaplains these days are using much more um, things like iPads and so on that can access all kinds of music that may be important to patients and residents and we would certainly encourage you to do that so that you can ask a question like what's your favorite song is there something you'd like to hear and then have it with you um, by being able to carry just a small computer with you So that's all the questions we have on the screen. Now's your moment if you have any further questions that you'd like to write in, and then we will sign off. Okay, thank you to Reverend Teal and Rabbi Pasha Orlo for today's webinar and to everyone for joining us today. The slides and the recording of this webinar will be posted on the ACPE Academy webpage later this week. Information about upcoming webinars can also be found on that page. So thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.